My journey has been one of returning from the darkness and stepping out into the light once more. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logos and Trivial. While you're sitting trying to figure that out, this is my podcast. Allegedly. <laughs> Logos and Trivial podcast. I'm Chance Lunsford. I'm also Logos and Trivial. Maybe you're also Logos and Trivial. While you're trying to figure out how to pronounce that and what it means to you, let me introduce today's three special guests. This is, this is a special podcast for me because each of these three gentlemen uh, mean a great deal to me. Their wisdom and their friendship and uh, their sometimes uninvited but always welcome guidance uh, has, has been of great value to me and to a lot of other people out there in the digital space. But I have with me today the Grey Wave, the Council of the, Council of the Elders, First up, we have Chief Chuck. He missed out on the last one, but he's here today. And the chief is chiefly. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. It's, it's right up his alley. Chief is a leader, and he's a joker. And he's got a lot of things to say uh, in a way that makes it very palatable to absorb the things that he's saying. Even if he's poking fun at you, he's having fun with you. And he's making sure that you have fun with him too. And that kind of wisdom is sneaky, but it's one of the critical tools of leadership in the world today, especially when people are taking things so seriously and getting so offended. And Chief has been one of my longest running uh, friends on Twitter and supporters. And it's an honor to have you here, Chief. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Billy Redhorse, the gentleman mystic, and is sort of right there in the title. Uh, he is a gentleman. Manners are important. Respect is important. And taking a look at things through the lens of beauty and wonder is a very important aspect of what Billy Redhorse does. And of all three of these gentlemen, he's the one who might slip into the DMs and say, Mr. Lunsford, I think you probably are approaching this the wrong way. That's not respectful, or that's not the kind of tone that I've grown to expect from you. I'm going to mute you again. I'll check back on you in a couple of weeks and see what you're up to. And whenever I get one of those messages from Red Horse, uh, it's, it's one of those times where I check myself and I go, oh, yep, that's exactly right. And that kind of friendship... Like Noble Brown said the other day, we all need more friends like that. And, uh, <laughs> and so with that, Red Horse, thank you for being here. Me, hey, and uh, if you will go back through the DMs, you'll note that uh, you haven't been checked thusly in, in a while, so that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. And finally, we have Mr. Do Hard Things, Dennis Hines. <laughs> Dennis is a man who, <laughs> he's the kind of guy you want to have in your life as a young man because you look at him and you go, well, he's more jacked than I am. He's thoughtful in his approach. He's doing all these cool things and he's, you know, 30 years my senior. There's no excuse for me to be slouching. There's no excuse for me to be lame. There's no excuse for me to be melting a hole in my couch. I need to get out there and make sure that uh, when I get a little bit older, I'm still able to do all these cool things. And his reminders are more often on the timeline than they are on the DMs, but he does a hard thing and he reminds you that hard things are worth doing because that's where self-respect comes from. That's where the discipline to be able to accomplish the goals that you have set forth come from. And it's something that I always love to see. Dennis hanging upside down, listening to music and smiling at the camera is always a treat. So Dennis, thank you for being here. Welcome back and uh, <laughs> glad to have you. Thanks, it's good to be here. So gentlemen, this is what I hope will be a fairly regular thing. I like having you guys on here. And I, uh, I know that the Logos and Trivical audience also does. Every time I announce that one or all of you are going to be on here, everybody just goes, all right. <laughs> so what I would like to do to start this off is 
maybe I'll set the scene and then I'll just kind of pass it off and we can play it that way. It's 2020. We're in a world where everything is bifurcated. Everything is politicized. Everything is uh, energized and cranked up to maximum obnoxiousness. And there's, there's so much more noise than signal and everything that's being pumped into the zeitgeist. And we talked a little bit about about this before we started recording and Dennis you said I have zeitgeist fatigue I'm tired of it I've had it up to here because it's just it's too much it's too constant and I know that a lot of people are feeling quite a bit of frustration and confusion fear and doubt about what's going to come from all of this and and the directions that we're heading in and I guess I just wonder, and maybe let's start with you, Dennis, because you had started to get rolling on this idea initially. What, what's to be done about this zeitgeist fatigue, this, this uh, ratcheted up hostility, this intensely bifurcated, nonsensical news cycle? I mean, what it, where, do we, where are we going and what are we to do about it? Ooh. You know, you kind of nailed a question right there that's been um, prominent since uh, all this spooled up in my own assessment of how things, how I, what was going to happen with me going forward. And what I found was that uh, what what I call that zeitgeist fatigue was that if you're paying attention, uh, you realize that there are a lot of things that are going on now that are very um, disruptive. And uh, we, we kind of, we were, we were doing okay, you know, we had our ups and downs, had that, but all of a sudden, and I don't know that we're in a black swan for humanity or anything like that, but we had a very big change of the paradigm. Everything changed. And it's still changing right in front of us. I mean, that's part of uh, that's part of what's going on is that it's forced change, and we're not um, unless you unless you try to inculcate that that ability to, to 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 manage change, or at least this is what you say. You know, you you want to be able to manage change, and so. Um, going through things uh, um, you you put yourself out into change so that your change muscle your your adaptive muscle will respond uh, better let's say and cope better well what i found was from feeding myself constantly i all of a sudden i was an expert on viruses (laughs) and all of a sudden i'm an expert on chinese dams and vaccines and and political uh, Solowinsky tactics, and it's like no, I'm not. I'm not. I've been dumping all this crap in my head, and what I found was is that it was uh, it was making me question how 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 sincere and how real are the the things that you put out as. Um, good attributes to have. How real is it in here? Uh, And I was finding myself like just basically spooling into places. It's like, I'm not enjoying life. I'm always on a, a button, you know, it's like, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? It's like a chronic anxiety. I mean, sincerely, that's what was going on. And I'm thinking, okay, how do I address this problem? And, and I think that uh, in myself. And, um, so as far as the outside world, what do I need to do? I need to curate what gets into my head, what gets between my ears. I don't need to know every little thing that's going on. It's like a feeding frenzy. That was my my condition. Just was like, I got to know. I got to know. Like, there's some stuff that's so unpredictable. And what I found was, is that was, um, that was eroding, um, my enjoyment 
and pleasure and life. I, I was always walking around all bunched up. And it's like, I'm not even taking a minute here. There's three bluebirds sitting there. And I'm thinking about the Three Gorges Dam. Mm. What the hell is wrong with me? So my strategy has been to truncate a great deal of information that's coming in. It's just superfluous. It's, it's clickbait. It's all that. To really ratchet down on that. And then to um, go back to... A, a, original steps, original things, uh, go back to, um, all I can work on and, and the best way for me to approach, uh, what's going on is to, and I know it's an overused word is to optimize myself internally to, to make me better and make me more, uh, capable of whatever's coming of dealing with that. So that is where my focus, I have really, and, it's, and, it, and it, that's one thing. This whole situation is an opportunity. It's an opportunity in the biggest sense of the word. I, when I was a kid growing up, I, I always had this fantasy of being a monk, you know, and, and I, of course he was a Shaolin monk and doing Kung Fu and, but always you're in this real austere situation and you're very isolated and all that. Well, here you go. Here it is. You've got an opportunity now with, uh, in my, in my case, I have been very isolated since February. Um, part of that is the fact that my wife is, um, heavily engaged with elder care with her father. So my father-in-law is in that profile, high risk profile. And that being the case, and this is the thing that I think a lot of people, when they get into the back and forth is they don't understand it. Everybody's circumstance is different. And you've got to decide for yourself whether you're going to take this action or that action, not have it mandated from up high and it one size fits all. So for me, what that means is that my isolation has been pretty intense because I do not want to be the grim reaper. I do not want to go out and do something and be con, you know, contract COVID pass it to my wife and pass it to my father-in-law. So the, that, that's been a very interesting situation where I've been very isolated. So it's like, what can you do within that circumstance? What can you do to make the best of it? And it's not for me, it's not anything I can do externally. It's all been internal and, and okay, you need to do or work on this, work on that, work on this. And that's, that's, that's what I see it as, as, as an opportunity. So it's like, even if it's something trivial and mundane, but you always wanted to do it, or you always wanted to try it, go ahead and do it. You know, if you want to, uh, there's all these disciplines and stuff that are out there that people are doing, or they're touting, you know, you've got breath work, you've got flexibility, you got all these different things. It's the perfect time to do it. If you're not out hanging out and you're not in, in the, trying to normalize whatever that means you're spending a lot of time with yourself and that that's a good thing that's not a bad thing uh, you, you, we haven't had that time we've had to fight to not be uh totally engaged and overwhelmed and uh, now you, you're cut off unless you go through this thing here the screen and the screen is it's it's a uh it's a siren. It's a siren calling us, calling us. And we've got to stuff our ears with wax and tie ourselves to the mast and not be drawn into it, not go into the maelstrom. I, I don't think that that's the solution is to go out and start swinging. And that's where my, uh, and I don't know where things are going. 
anyway, I could, I could, this is deep. This, I've, I've thought about this a lot, a lot because of how, how difficult it's been for me. It's been difficult. I've got to admit that this has not been a piece of cake is making these adjustments, much less, uh, just sweeping out any, um, at this point, feeling like they, any plans that I've made for the, the arc of time from this time going forward till I'm in the dirt, those plans have changed dramatically. I don't know where they're going. I don't know what's going to happen. So it's a matter of, of understanding and looking at that the paradigm has changed. And it's changed for everybody, whether they know it or not. It, it, you can struggle to to make it the same or do something, but you, there are things that have, have occurred in our country, in particular, that are very uh, fundamentally disruptive of at least the narrative that that Americans give themselves: home of the free, you know, land of the brave, um, home of the brave, land of the free. You know, it's, it's that's come under play. That's come under question because of, and, and it's from watching how we as Americans have reacted. So we're in a different ball game, and uh, I'm still wrestling with it. I wrestle with it every day, trying to figure out what's going on. So. One of the things that you said that I really picked up on there and can relate to a lot is taking, taking this time to, to look internally because I have found myself many times in the last six months being drawn into one thing or being drawn into another and then a gentle or sometimes not so gentle reminder comes into my life. I talk to my creator, he talks back to me, and if you understand the language, you, you begin to see. And it's, it's sort of like chance, chance. That's not who you are. That's not, you're not, you're not building your actions on top of your principles. You're building them on quicksand and you're gonna get stuck if you're not careful, you need to step back. You, and, and I think that's, that's one of those things that's very important to think about in these disruptive times. It's like, well, okay, what am I building a life on top of? What are my principles? What are those first things that are the foundation of everything else I'm going to do? Because if everything is in flux out here, all I can do is look in here and make sure that I'm right on my 10 rules for life or whatever, you know, whatever you have. And, and if you don't even know what that is, boy, spend a lot of time with yourself and asking those questions and writing them down might be a really beneficial practice. But if you know what they are, you got to check yourself. You got to say, you know, chance, are you, are you acting in accordance with your principles? Are you doing the things that the rules that you have set for yourself would dictate that you do? And I find myself answering no, more frequently in the last six months than I have in the last five years. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that in a certain sense because it's like, oh, okay, uh, there's some stuff in here I got to pull out and take a look at and I've got the time and so I'm going to do it. And I've been grateful for that because I have my kids here with me and I have my wife here with me and my wife has been very much sort of uh, alerted to some of the things that I had been trying to communicate to her for a long time, but just didn't have the skills or maybe she didn't have the ears to hear, but now she looks out at the world and she sees things. And now she's coming back to me from that place and going, Chance, you're not, this is not what you are supposed to be doing. And I, and I think, and I go, well, this is my wife and she loves me and she understands better now and she's right. And I guess what I want to do with that is, I think that this is a good point for Chief to jump in because you mentioned before we started recording too that you know you've kind of been working from home except for these times when you've traveled around, um, and so you're you're sort of in this bunker and then you go out into the world for a little bit and then you come back and you're bunkered down and I guess I wonder. Dennis said my plans for the future are up in the air. I don't know what's going to happen with any of this, and um, you know. You're, you're a gentleman of a, of a certain age. 
I'm sure you got plans for the future and spending time with kids and grandkids and that kind of thing that now it's, it's less certain. And I guess I just wonder how, how you're processing this and how sort of the, the juxtaposition between I'm sitting here at home all the time and then I'm, I'm going out into the world for brief moments and looking at the things that are around me. I, I really kind of wonder how that's informing your perspective and what you have to, to kind of add on to what Dennis was saying. Yeah, I mean, for me, we started telework, mandated telework on about a two-hour notice on March 16th. And it's notable, I still go into my office about once every two weeks because of IT restrictions. We have to go in and I have to plug my computer into the secure wire. But my account desk calendar still is, is March 16th, and I refuse to move it. It's almost like the clocks that stopped during Hiroshima. Uh, you know, the detonation, and that's the way I kind of, at first, that's the kind of way I looked at it was, you know, this was the atomic bomb of, of my leadership. Um, I manage and lead a team of about 13 people, and we all started working remotely all of a sudden. Um, I had been pushing a telework agenda for years. You know, I thought it was time. I thought it was we could do it. Um, so here we were. Um, we were thrust into it, and it's amazing what the government can do on short notice when they have to do something. <laughs> Um, things that we had been talking about for years, but would never get around to, we now had to do in a matter of a days, if not hours. So I did a lot of reflection on it when I got here and now I'm leading a team remotely. Um, so I, 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 you know, I realized that I could look at this two ways. I could look at it as a pain in the ass or I could look at it as a blessing and I chose blessing. Because for a couple of reasons, and a lot of them are selfish, to be quite honest with everybody. Um, a, I had gotten my agenda finally pushed through by force. You know, now we were teleworking and I've been wanting to do this. But the bigger challenge was, is, is for me at my age and for the years that I've been doing this, oh boy, here comes a new leadership challenge. This is new. I've never had to remotely manage this many people in this big of a program this far remote and under these conditions. So to me, it was fun. I just chose to, this is, this is now fun because you told me, all of the people that say, we can't do this during telework. We can't do this. We can't do that. Oh boy, let me show you how we can. And it really personified and it, it, it kind of really just concentrated everybody else's mindset around me that, you know, tell me, tell me again how we can't, and I'll give you 15 reasons why we can and how we can do it. Um, and I'll prove you wrong and we'll do it and we'll do it better. And I have the metrics to back it up. My team, I track metrics like a fiend because despite what you see on Twitter and my personality, I am a really good program manager and a good project manager and I'm a metrics fiend. Um, I have numbers to prove that my team is 37% more efficient over telework than we were when we were in the office. And I got a lot of reasons that you can tell you why, but the point is, is people, I think inherently, I didn't have to push them. People inherently in a time of what they perceive as a crisis, I think our instinct and our DNA instinctively makes us improvise, adapt, and overcome. Mm. You, that, it's just that survival gene. Now something, my, my world is thrown out of its routine and it's chaos. Your basic instinct is to survive and do what you need to do to survive. So being at home has been, gosh, man, it has been such a blessing for me. Um, health wise, mentally, I mean, mental, physical, everything, you know, as to where now I don't have to get up in the morning, rush to the office, get dressed, drive, put up with idiots on the road, get to my office, go through the routine. Of, hey, how was your weekend? How was your weekend? How was your weekend? <laughs> now, now I have that time to where I'm getting up in the morning. I have my coffee. Yes, to the great relief and, and happiness of these two gentlemen that are on the screen, I've actually, believe it or not, I can actually meditate now without falling asleep. <laughs> I can, yes, I can, I can physically <laughs> sit and just breathe and focus on my breathing and focus on things and just be free without falling asleep. And I can only do it for about five to six minutes. But for me, that is a tremendous, tremendous accomplishment. But I found that I had time to go out on my back deck and have my coffee and hear the birds. And I started doing my, and then I go for my walk. And I used to go for my walk 
only to get my 20 minutes, 30 minutes of cardio in, get the walk done, get in the shower, get ready, go to work. The funniest things have happened on these walks. And, and, and these two gentlemen will appreciate it. Probably they're just going to go. Yes, yeah, stupid. We've tried to tell you this ever since we've known you. But when I go for my walks, I have a rolling neighborhood, but I've actually become so in tune with my surroundings. I can feel the atmospheric and climatological changes when I go for this mile, mile and a half walk. I can feel the temperature change. Hell, I can almost feel the dew point change because I'm not focused on the end. I'm focused on the journey. I'm walking. I don't have to be back. Any, I don't have to. All I got to do is go back and really just sit down at my computer. I don't have to shower. I don't have to, I don't have to wear pants if I don't want to. And I'm not going to stand up now. So, but, <laughs> but, but that's the thing. I mean, is it's, it's a total mindset change. So instead of me, you know, com, you know, a lot of people you see, they've, they've struggled hard with it. Some people have just complained about it because, well, they just like to complain. Um, I've had the hardships. So there's been time. I mean, I'm frustrated. I want to go, but you know, it's a blessing. And I chose to look at it that way. And then when I go out into the world, you know, it's, it's really, I think to, to Dennis's point to where the overload of information that you get online, we were out and about this past weekend or last weekend, I had some people I needed to go see and some personal things to take care of. But, you know, I got to stop and visit with, uh, with Ryan Feldman, you know, man integrated or path to manliness. Sorry. Um, you know, but we took, we did saw some family and all this, but you go through these little towns, you know what, here's the thing. There was, you know, still statues standing of both union and Confederate battles. There were people in the town square, of different races, different ethnic backgrounds, diversity, and they're all sitting at coffee shops and they're all, Hey, how you doing? You know, people are still people and we're, we're being played to a large extent in the media. And I think Dennis hit on it that, you know, the biggest thing that's helped me too is, is I don't watch the news and it's hard to do when you live in the DC area, you are surrounded by it. You're infiltrated by it and it can form your perspective to a bad way if you're not careful, but purposefully making myself, I watch a lot of Andy Griffith a lot. So, you know, and that keeps me sane. So that's, that's been the easiest thing for me to handle is looking at it as a challenge Look at it as a blessing and an opportunity like we've all talked about. And this is a chance to better yourself. So I think that's where people really need to focus is don't focus on how bad it is that you can't go. You can't, you can't quit focusing on. You can't, this is what I get to do. You know, you want to try yoga, try yoga. I call it stretching because yoga just sounds too foo-foo for me. Um, We called it, we called it stretching. I don't call it working out. It's calisthenics. We did calisthenics in the military. Um, it's not, it's nothing like that, but it's, it's, it's a chance to get out and be able to do those things that you really wanted to do. So look at it that way. So there's this old joke by Bill Hicks and he's talking about Ted Turner and CNN and he says, you know, you look at the news and it's war, disease, famine, war, disease, famine. And then you look out your window and it's crickets and it's sunshine and you go, well, where's all the war and disease and famine? And I think that's becoming abundantly clear to a lot more people than it ever has before. It seems to me from my sort of limited experience in the world that all news has been fake news for all time, pretty much. And and it's just being highlighted at this point. And what I, my daughters went out, and had a lemonade stand in front of my house on Friday. And they made like 48 bucks in 90 minutes. And the reason that they were able to make that kind of money is because my neighbors are kind people and they came over and said, oh, you're selling lemonade and, and cinnamon rolls? Cool, here's here's the dollar for the lemonade and here's the dollar for the cinnamon rolls and then here's five bucks because you're my neighbor and you're a cute kid. And that's most people right there. And it was, it was cool just as a little aside my daughter earned some money and she wanted to do this lemonade stand. I said, all right, you can either go buy this thing that you wanted or you can invest in your business and then we can set aside some of this money and go buy some other stuff. And so now she's she's gotten bitten by the entrepreneurial bug a little bit. And she's really excited and they made a little lemon head costume and had my youngest dancing around. So the point I'm making with all of that is just to say, 
You know, my kids go, COVID sucks. And then they go outside and have a lemonade stand. And my neighbors go, COVID sucks. And then they come over to the lemonade stand and they give my kid five bucks for a, a drink of crappy lemonade. And I go, COVID sucks. And then I look at my kids and I smile and I laugh. And I think that that's probably a more common experience amongst everybody out there, even the most radically active people on the Twitter or in the political realm or whatever, they go and they have their little tantrum on Twitter and then they go off and they go, Hey, significant other, let's watch a movie tonight. Or, you know, I'm still having dinner every damn day and it's, uh, you know, I'm still enjoying it with the people that I love and maybe our conversation subjects have changed. But I, I think that that is what people are forgetting about everybody else. It's like there's still just people out there. They're still just doing the things that they need to to be able to enjoy their life to the best of their capacity. And I, I wonder, coming from that framework, I think it's a good time to pass it over to the gentleman mystic and, and just kind of ask you, Red Horse, from a from a gentleman mystic perspective, what do you suppose, where do you suppose that the ideas of beauty and honor and respect and gratitude factor into all of this? How, how do they help us maybe realign our mentality and realign our perspective to remember the things that we've kind of all been talking about, that it starts from within and it spreads to the people that are right around you that you care about and love and that those ripples kind of spread out, I, you know, it seems like people have sort of lost the ability to communicate in the ways that bring about concord rather than, than discord. And I wonder sort of your take on all of that and, and maybe what you would point us towards. The thing that I have written about extensively uh, away from the 280 character limit <clears throat> has been a theme that I have constantly revisited uh, with regard to what it is that separates the human animal from all of our other uh, animal family, and that is manners. And some people will only think that I'm talking about etiquette and uh, following rules and you know, which fort do you use, what knot do you tie with your uh, suit, what uh, you know, how, how do you uh, address someone? And certainly that's part of it. But I speak more towards what I view as the refinement of who human beings are as a species. And it is this dynamic, this interaction uh, that humans have or should have that seems to be... Uh, daily vanishing. Uh, it's a civility. Uh, a, you know, I have talked uh, on a video and that occasionally I recycle on Twitter, uh, a mystic minute about uh, my view on respect. And people would think based on what I just said that I, I believe everybody should be respected. Everybody should uh, uh, be treated thusly. And I don't because respect is something that has to be earned. And now that does not mean that we don't uh, act courteously to other people, that we do not uh, treat people with dignity, even if they don't deserve it. Uh, otherwise, they, we do dehumanize them, to use the term that you used, uh, that you mentioned earlier, Mr. Lunsford. Um, but the so long as we allow others to drive our narrative, you know, narrative being another big buzzword of the day, um, we're going to be subject to giving away our power. And another thing that is so important to me is power. And power does not, power does not mean that you're the godfather and, or a president or a, a senator and you, you move little chess pieces on a board. Power is agency. It, it is self-expression. It is self-motivation. Um, and too many people are allowing themselves to be uh, chess pieces on a board, mostly pawns. Um, 
I, I view the, the fact that I hate this politician, blah, blah, blah. That's what people think they hate, you know, politician A. They don't hate the politician. They hate this image that they have created in their mind of who and what this politician is based on the input of someone else who has done exactly the same thing. Now, yes, politician A may be a bore. This politician may be uncouth. This politician may be mean. Or this next door neighbor may be mean. Or this uh, businessman may be mean. But the... You know, walk with me here. You know, we all have families. You know, we all have significant others. You know, kids. Um, Even in that close proximity, we can never completely know anyone else. Hell, we can barely even know ourselves. And the farther the proximity is, the less likely you are to know someone. So a fake news, you know, to narrative or a uh, propaganda narrative you got to look at what someone else is trying to accomplish by this sort of manipulation you know that's to your question that's the thing that i am constantly aware of uh i had made mentioned uh in a uh, i think it was probably two months ago a tweet that uh, i was already feeling uh panic fatigue and I had even reached out to my brother, the chief, early on in this, hoping that this would be over and done with by this point, uh, not realizing that this was going to be something that's going to drag on and probably magically disappear in mid-November. Um, that just how it was, it was whooping my ass and I was getting off message. And I had to remember those bluebirds. I had to remember those dew points, the change in the, in the, in the barometric pressure and get back on message. And yeah, some, some could say how shallow of you that you're, that you're talking about manners and, and, and uh, nice boots and, and waistcoats and, uh, you know, good whiskeys. Well, those are the things that make my life beautiful. You know, interacting with my brothers, with my young nephew here, this, this, this is what the meaning in my life and to let someone else determine that meaning is giving away my power. Now, after that inspiring little bit of, uh, you know, information, something that has to be considered and something that I have had to admit, uh, I understand the importance of looking at history. Uh, in my in the fourth grade, I can remember the back when they actually used to teach history. Um, the discussion coming up about the Roman Empire and how Rome collapsed. Now we're not going to talk about the benefits or the whys and wherefores of you know colonization and conquering and slavery and all that. That's not my point. Point is, you had this great civilization that spread that existed, and it collapsed under its own weight. I can remember in the fourth grade, nine years old, looking at my teacher and saying, well, what's to stop that from happening here? And I have, uh, there are those that say that um, the average length of a republic, the average lifespan of of a republic is 200 to 250 years. Well, if that's accurate, even remotely, we in the United States have outlived our life expectancy. So what I have to acknowledge and operate from now is the fact that um, chaos is here. Change is here. Don't try to go back and force this past that we had into a future. I have had to freely admit and come to terms with and find peace with the fact it, it is my view that within the next decades, possibly, maybe even years, um, the United States, as we know it, will cease to exist. There will not be one country. I can easily see the United States uh, splitting into three countries, a western region, a northeastern region, and then a central and southern region. And that is based solely on 
uh, philosophies and and uh, Weltanschauungs and how how you, you want to live your life. And I do I de- I default to freedom. And if you want to live your life in such a way that that you're burning buildings and and destroying uh, property, um, as long as it's not mine or those that I love, well, if if that's how you want to live your life, okay. So, you know, the folks that want to do that need to live in their own region. The folks that want to just go out and have lemonade stands and, and, and take walks and, and pet dogs, they need to have their own thing. I default to freedom. Choose what, you know, choose what it is that you want, decide what you want and pay for it. It's that simple. And I have had to come to the, to the realization, okay, what I grew up with that, uh, you know, apple pie and, you know, land of the free and home of the brave. Um, that probably ain't coming back in that form. And it's, it's, uh, you know, maybe it's time for a new, uh, refinement, new manners, new acceptance of, uh, you know, opportunity as the chief said. Um, and this is not some Pollyanna ish, uh, you know, unicorn fart smelling thing. This is okay. What do we do to take this thing that we find ourselves stewing in right now and make it beautiful? How do we, how do we refine it? How do we glory in it? How do we grow from it rather than how do we just, uh, rot in it? And right now there's the thing that, that saddens me the most is that so many of my brothers and sisters, not just in the States, but around the world are the, the rudders are gone. The ships are just at, at sea. Sorry to be uh, stepping on your toes there, chief with, without rudders, without engines, without sails. And humans don't like to be lost. We like a compass. We like to know where we're going. We like to know that we have the ability to get there and that we have the, the fortitude and the wherewithal to support one another to get there. And, you know, this, this time is, I, I, I honestly, I, I don't believe this is hyperbole. This, is, this time is for the, the citizens of the United States of America unprecedented. Uh, yeah, there may have been uh, shots fired in the 1860s, but I think we're in the middle of a, a cultural upheaval now equal to, if not more so than that, uh, energetically. And the sad thing about it is it's not from people having their own perspective. It's from, from narratives being enforced from the outside. And that's what makes me so sad. People are rolling over. This is a, the, the goddess of this land is freedom is I mean, you, the, the Harbor in New York. That is a, representation of the sacredness of this land freedom and people are just here here's my freedom take it here's my oh i don't need no tell me what to do tell me what to do and and (laughs) gentlemen the gentleman mystic does not talk about politics i'm not talking about politics i am talking about something fundamental to who we are as men as citizens of the mother earth and as as a a better representation than what we're uh, presenting ourselves right now. Hey, I've spoken. I'm going to go a little bit abstract here for a second. I think it's I think it's appropriate. <coughs> if you imagine that. Uh, sort of the energy of life is a sea. It could be calmer or more turbulent. And right now it's very turbulent. And, and to me, sort of the definition of a child or the developmental process is, is learning how to swim. And there's a lot of splashing and sort of choking that goes on while you're trying to learn to keep your head above water. But when you learn to swim, you can head for the shore and just stand up on your own two feet. And you don't want to walk away from the ocean because it's, it's, it's where it's what, life flows from but part of being an adult is learning how to calm those waters it's like you're taking a bull 
and he scooped it up, and then he carefully walked back a few feet from the ocean, and he looked down, and as the water calms in that bowl, you see your reflection, and you reflect on your life, and you see yourself a little bit clearly. And the problem maybe is that, or not a problem, but just reality is that if you try to hold up that bowl to show other people what you see in yourself, the water all falls out and they just see a bowl. And you sort of just pour out that energy trying to justify yourself to the world when really it was that process of reflection that was the point. And then you walk back out and you teach the kids how to swim because you don't want them to drown. You want them to be able to keep their head above water, even in that choppy water. And like you said, Red Horse, it's, it's, there's some big waves. And there's only, there's only a few people out there in the world who can surf those big waves and not get pummeled by them. And even then, that doesn't last forever. And I guess, after getting a little bit holding crystals in my hand, <laughs> kind of a situation there. Um, I recognize that it's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to do that. It's hard to take that bowl and look at your reflection and go, "This is me. This is honestly who I am." And if I don't like what I'm seeing in here, I got to do something about that. And it doesn't have anything to do with what's out there. It has everything to do with me in here. I try to remind yeah. myself that there are people out there who have just immeasurably more difficult lives than I do, and they're doing fine. There's no reason for me to be a bitch about my life because it's harder than it was yesterday. That's not a problem. That's an opportunity. And I think that's a lot of what we've been talking about. And respect is important. And to really make that concrete, Chief, I want to respect you, and I know that we have some time limits on your participation. And I, I guess I wonder, as a last opportunity to reflect on these things before you go fulfill some responsibilities uh, and build that community and show that respect, is there anything you feel like needs to be said by you to the people who are tuning in here? Any sort of uh, like advice or, or things to consider? that they might take with them before you go do your thing? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you, I think all three of us, all four of us really have, have, we've hit on some great points and I don't think it, I think when people look back at this and they view it, I think they're, it's not going to be particularly any aha moment. It's going to be, Oh yeah. You know, we've heard, we, we've known this, but sometimes you just have to be reminded of it. Um, just by a weird opportunity, the one thing that has really hasn't really changed my mindset, but it's helped shape it a little bit and perspective wise. I I picked up a Kindle book for for free, just said, you know what, this is something to read at night. And it's really kind of helped me. It's about and I've tweeted about it. It's about the Byzantine Empire. And to that one Twitter dude that keeps tweeting me and DMing me and reminding me that they refer to themselves as Romans. I am perfectly fucking aware of that. <laughs> I'm not stupid. But for the point of reference so that people don't confuse it with the Roman Empire that they picture of the togas and the Colosseum and the Parthenon, I am speaking of the Byzantine Empire roughly in the first thousand years of modern time. So all of that disclaimer aside, reading this book, it occurred to me that the old saying that I've heard a thousand people say before, there's really nothing new under the sun. The, same, the Byzantine Empire went through the same exact things that we're going through. It's just in a different kind of context and frame, but they still, they had political upheaval. They had emperors that they didn't like. They had a lot of incestuous, you know, and I'm going to promote you because you're my you know, girlfriend, mistress, whatever, we're going to kill people. We're going to plot to get rid of people. We're going to plot to change the course of history. And they did, obviously we're, we're here. So to, to both Dennis and Red Horse's point is we are 
in the midst of our own empire shift. We are forging history. Um, nobody's, I don't care how you think this came about. I don't care how you think it came about. It doesn't matter. It's here. It's happened. So now we're shifting. We're shifting history. So really, I think my advice and, and the things that I try to remind everyone is be very mindful of how do we want this to come out in the end? You can either be a participant or you can be a spectator. Uh, sometimes, you you know, in some of the cheese words, you can be the windshield or you can be the bug. It really doesn't. It's going to you're going to be one or the other. So which one do you choose to be? You know, and you go out and do that. This is a chance to shape history. I think all of us, in some sense, the, 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 the people that we associate with, both online and in real life, I think we're all doing good things to shape that history. Either, if, if nothing else, from just looking inwards and changing how we think about something. And, and I'll go back to Dennis. Dennis has done a lot of inside thinking on this, and he's, he talked about his internal thinking. Well, I could sit here and go, well, what does that got to do with me? Well, I'll tell you what it's got to do with me. Dennis is going to do some internal thinking, and he's going to, he's going to put something out there online one day, and I'm going to read it. And I'm going to absorb that and I'm going to consume it. And then I'm going to, I'm going to machinate on it a little bit. And then I'm going to do something with it. And then somebody's going to pick up what I say or write about it. And then they're going to take it and run with it. And then, so, you know, the old Breck shampoo commercial, which only the three of us, not you chance, you probably don't remember <laughs> the Breck shampoo commercial, but us three old dudes do. Of I told two friends and they told two friends and so on and so on. That's how we shift and shape history. Dennis gets a seed. I take that seed, you know, I pass that seed, you know, we all, and we all put our own things on it. And so collectively we're all shifting and shaping history. So, you know, be mindful of that. If nothing else, be, be mindful of how you're shaping history. And this is coming from the guy that has no filter on social media as I'm reminded very often by my friends and my brothers of my, my lack of filter, but that's just me. That's what you get. You want if you want respectful and manners, you go to Billy. If you want <laughs> hard things with a, a fifteen pound mall, you go look at Dennis. If you just want some guy that's going to blast his opinion straight at you, you come to the chief. All three of us put together, you know, we it, it makes a it makes a balanced team. And the rest of the the Twitter sphere, as I call it, you know, and we really are a community. You know, make no bones about it. I don't care how we how we're connected. We are a community and we're a family. You know, you don't always have to like the, the drunk uncle that you keep up in the attic, but, you know, we have ours and we have our good, good parts of the family. So, you know, we all come together and we make our own collective selves better and we make each other better. So just, I guess, you know, in a, in a simple term, everybody just calm down, man. Just chill. It'll be all right. We, this, this, this world has gone through many, many, many things. It's going to go through many, many more things. 150 years from now, I don't think anybody's going to really care what we talked about. They're going to be going through their own thing. So it'll be all right. Hey. Well, Chief, that's, that's, a, that's beautifully put. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm sorry. I got to drop out. I got to just for everybody watching, just so you know, we've had a lot of rain in the mid Atlantic. We had a storm and then we've had a lot of rain the last few days. So the winds picked up and uh, my neighbor has a tree down. And because he is, I guess what Twitter would call is a soy boy or something. I don't know what they call him. He doesn't own a chainsaw. (laughs) So I do. I'm an alpha male. I have two chainsaws. One for a chance. Sometimes I I shave with my chainsaws. But, you know, that's okay. (laughs) So I got to go help him get rid of this tree. So I'm getting my workout in today. So, you know, so Dennis, I'm going to do a hard thing. and I'm going to go move these logs on the wet ground. So. In the humidity, so yeah, sweat hard. <laughs> Always, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, thank take you. care, brother. Good, love you. you. Well, let's wait till he goes, and then we can make fun of him. There we go. <laughs> it's always good to have him around. I'm glad we were able to make it work with him this time around too. That's mm-hmm. he provides a good. Uh, you know, his his character is fun to throw into the mix. Well, so, you know, really, if I may interject here, it it, it would be kind of good at this point, even though we normally run very long, to uh, maybe kind of, you know, bring this one back into the port and just kind of kind of each of us make our own little denouement. And, you know, not to hijack your show, Mr. Lunsford, but uh, 
I, I realize that uh, this is what your third podcast in the last eight hours. So you should, you know, don't, uh, don't overextend your young self. <laughs> it's i uh, I'm just the host of your podcast. Every time I have a guest, it's theirs. So look, uh, I, I'm, I'm cool with that. I mean, people have heard me talk just <laughs> plenty. So, so, uh, since, uh, since you're sort of on topic there, Red Horse, why don't you go ahead and say what you have to say and, and leave them with some, leave them with something impactful before we, before we do our thing. Well, sometimes the impactful is just as the chief alluded to, it's the obvious thing. Um, we, we so desire certainty in our lives that, uh, if the only thing that seems to be certain is fear or anger or rage or confusion, we will continue to reach out for that just because it's, it's the guaranteed thing. It's the certain thing. Um, that is bad medicine. That is. And unfortunately, uh, in, in the last six months, this has been, uh, ramped up to a level that I've never encountered in my six decades on this planet. Uh, it certainly, uh, as we've said, talking about history, it's, it, this is not the first time that it's ever happened, but, uh, for me in my life and my experience, I have never experienced it this way before. Um, uh, certainly my brother, uh, Dennis has uh, almost 10 years on me. And so he, he has even more experience to, you know, things to compare to, but the anger is never lessened by being angry. And, uh, you know, that sounds like a, uh, you know, just pablum and, you know, fine. If that's what someone wants to view it as. And, and I am not saying, you know, peace, love and understanding. I'm just, you know, stop take a breath, listen to the bluebirds. If you're blessed to have them singing even better, if you can see them walk away for a minute and be willing to be wrong. You know, that's another part of what we're dealing with. Now we, we have the uh, paradox of, uh, you know, everybody gets a participation trophy for just getting out of bed in the morning. But you have to, nobody can be wrong. If, if you, if you make a mistake, you're cast out forever. And I'm talking about a real mistake, not someone that makes a choice, gets caught and then says, Oh, I apologize. It was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Well, you knew that to begin with, which is why it's not a mistake. It's something else entirely. We've got to, I mean, if you want to, throw off the heaviest shackles in your life. You have got to get rid of your, you general, not you gentlemen specifically. You have to get rid of the, the, the shackles of willing self ignorance. Mm -hmm. And people are they're 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 bound under that heaviest of weights. You know, the self ignorance, belief, pretense and laziness. Those four things are, <clears throat> excuse me, in such evidence now in our world. And they are the four great enemies of humanity. And until they are addressed and uh, acted upon to, to lessen them or even better yet, remove them, uh, we're going to continue to find ourselves in this maelstrom of nonsense. And it, it, it really isn't that hard to, to resolve, you know, don't be unnecessarily aggressive, be kind, be considerate, be, be willing to listen to another person's perspective and fine. You may not like oysters. I don't like oysters, I, but I am not going to demand that you not eat oysters because I don't like oysters. <coughs> so it, it's, it is just that, so you, you know, you, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. It does not have to be, um, you know, the, the greatest sophistication is simplicity. I mean, if you, the, the, the world would radically change if we 
literally went back to the old live and let live. You know, they, uh, I, you know, how do you want to be treated? I don't want people screaming and yelling at me. I don't want people imposing their will on me. So I return in kind, simple, simple, fundamental, basic. That's what I teach. That's what I try to live. That's what I have allowed myself to get off topic in, in recent months. So I'm back to, I'm back to Brooks brothers shirts and Lou Casey cowboy boots and uh, McAllen whiskey and just waiting for the next time that I can get together with, with my brothers and, and, and share a dram and, we're long overdue, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lunsford, but then again, you're over in Utah, but I, I, that's one of the few parts of this country I've not seen. So there you have it. Well, Utah's mine and you're welcome. Just to, just to say, you know, it's, it's, it's my island. <laughs> Bless your heart, sir. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what you said, what the chief said, you know, he said, look, there's no, there's no great big aha moments where you realize something you haven't known. Those things are rare in life. Uh, one thing, the first time I had Kurt Schlichter on this podcast, I said, look, man, you do what you do and that's cool and everything, but do you feel like you are changing anybody's minds? And he said, that's not my job. You know, the commander doesn't try to convince the enemy of his viewpoint. He tries to make sure that the soldiers are in alignment with the mission. And if you take a look at that from a, from a human perspective, sometimes you just need the commander to be rah-rah about being a human. Sometimes you need your elders just to remind you, hey man, be human. Be a respectful human. Be the things that separate us from being a chimp or, or being an alligator. What is it? It's, it's character. Hey. It's belief. It's the thing. It's art. It's the things that matter to us. If you ask anybody who's 80, 999,999 people out of a million go, it was family and friends and acting in accordance with my character that mattered to me. And I wish I'd have done more of all three. Really? And I guess, Dennis, you, you started this off. And you started this off not necessarily on a super optimistic tone. And that's, that's, no, no, that's fine. That's, that's uh, true. I wouldn't want anything but honesty from anybody who comes here, but especially you guys, because I'm counting on you to, to be what this is intended to be, the Council of the Elders. But, you know, you listen to... You listen to me feeding off of you, and you listen to Chief, and you listen to Red Horse, and and now we're arriving back here, and I just, I guess I wonder, what is it that you are left with, and what do you want to leave us with um, after sort of sitting quietly through this conversation and thinking about things? It's tough going last. Because... <laughs> uh... That you're the headliner. Yeah, yeah. The, point, the, the points that everybody makes are the points that I was going to say, oh, I could do this one because I have to come up with something insightful, you know? And it's like, okay, this or that. And, oh, yeah. Billy Red Horse just got that one. Oh, Chuck said that. Now here, chance. Oh, now what have I got? What have I got? Um, so kind of an ad hoc thing ad lib but I, I would say that uh, one thing that I've noticed with in this conversation what's been going what I've seen is that uh, there's a each of us is is uh, dealing with this in our own uh, unique way but uh, what what underlies that what what seems to me that that keeps bubbling up and resurfacing are is core it's 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 principles values traditions it's a way of of um, addressing life 
and it's a perspective. It's like, where are you standing in when you address life? Where are you, where are you coming from? And um, so that for me, like just hearing just the different uh, things and where we went today. Um, one thing that I take away is that um, we all are still though, like at the gray table, we have time on people and we have experience on people. And so we've been through the loop a few more times and we've seen the various different iterations of what can happen. And from that, you come away with a, a sense of uh, um, just a different perspective. You, you, you grow over time. Uh, but the whole thing with the, what I've, what I, like I say, going back to the ground point is that it's still coming from a good spot. It's still coming from a place, even though we each, and it sounds like it to me, uh, like Chuck, his, he rolled back on his heels for, for a flat second. And the fact that, that he was thrown into and what his environment and his, in his workspace is, he didn't have time to lay back on his heels. He had to go forward and get up on his toes a little bit, you know, one degree forward, move your center mass a little forward. Um, that's how he, his description to me, um, was very, um, appropriate, uh, but it, it underlying that are those principles that, that resiliency, um, that approach to life to uh life goes on this is a moment we're having this moment it goes on um how you how you deal with it it doesn't matter how old you are we're gray okay i get it but we still have those same challenges and same uh things that that are going to test us regardless of how old you are, you never get to the spot where you got it so dialed in that nothing bugs you or there's not going to be any challenges. Um, so how each of us process that, what I saw uh, it distilled down really is, is there are certain fundamental principles and ways of, of being with people and how you treat them. And the gentleman mystic nails it. It's manners. It's how you. It, it's how you treat another human being. It, it's respect, and not going. You know, not hitting. Not everything's not a tripwire that you've got to go up and ramp up to stage nine. You know, it's no. You but treat people. Uh, try to be compassionate. Um, Listen, maybe, maybe just because they're yelling doesn't mean that you don't listen. They may be saying something or they're at least communicating something that is not just noise. It's just that their method of transmission may not be the best on your ears, but it's still, they're saying something and it's, 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 it behooves us to pay attention to all sides of the situation, just not let it pour in. <clears throat> I would say, I'd leave it with this. It's like when I said about going internal and being internal, it was that um, we are so interwoven in the world, in our environment, in other people, in uh, structures and everything. We're so interwoven it's very difficult to and when that starts to get all knotted up it's very difficult to be able to um, maintain a a uh, equanimous uh, disposition uh, just be a little bit more balanced don't let people push you off and throw you you know shove you into this corner or that corner balance it out Take a look at what's going on and I always go back to the point that to me is, um, and I said this on the, the very first podcast that you and I did together, Chance, uh, the, you know, it was the same thing. 
leave your, you know, what are you going to leave with? And it's, it's not comfort is a cage. It's not do hard things. Those are, those are ways to, um, spark something else. And that something else is that, that you believe in yourself, believe in, in the goodness of yourself as a being believe that, that, um, you can aspire to do better. You can aspire to bring things into the world and have a, have a relationship with other people in the world that is a net positive, that is a net good, that it's, there's, there's, a, there's a, even though you may not ever have a statue, it's, it's like a pebble in a pond or, you know, or a seed. It's, it's, you can, you send out a vibe, you can send out a vibe and that vibe believe that you can make that vibe positive, believe in yourself, believe, have the confidence and, and the belief to know that regardless of what comes in and regardless of how it's being all turned and twisted, you don't have to be turned in. You don't have to be twisted. You, you can stay on your path. You can stay on a, with some purity and, and, and a, with a good focus about if you want to be that person in the world, be that person in the world. So that, I would step back to that. I would say, just believe in yourself. You know, don't let all the, the, uh, the various nabobs all over the place and the, and the people that want to jab you as soon as they see a weak spot, they want to jab it and poke it. Don't let them kick you off into, um, of, of what your path is of your true North. Don't, don't let them take you off of that. And that, that is why I have had to, um, like I say, when I started out is going, it's an internal thing. That's, that's the internality that I was talking about is it's like, you've got to go back and touch the lodestone again and go back down to center because you've been, you know, I, I have to come back to center because I've been so, fractured and I found and I noticed that analytically I saw that man and you're really all over the place so what do you have to do and it goes back to um, various disciplines and a various point of view various practices that just bring you back home you know uh, pay attention to those things that work for you that keep you on uh, a good path a path of heart you know walk that path and, and believe that you can do it. Uh, don't let it, the naysayers make you weak and, and, and think that you can't carry the weight. You have the personal power to do it. Hmm. And that's it. I, I've, I've been gifted with a parable as I've been listening to you gentlemen, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and share it. I shall call it the parable of the five caterpillars. There were five caterpillars. They all ate and ate and consumed and consumed everything that they could consume that was within their reach. And they all survived until they wrapped themselves up in a cocoon and their bodies liquefied. And then they reconstituted and they became butterflies. And the first butterfly fluttered around and then was eaten by a lizard and it became lizard shit. And the lizard shit fed the ground and fed the plants and fed the network of fungus. And the second butterfly flew high into the sky and was eaten by a bird and it became bird shit. And the bird shit fed the ground and fed the plants and fed the network of fungus. The third butterfly flew to a branch and it sat in the shade and it looked at the world around it and it didn't do anything else and then it fell to the ground and it fed the ground and it fed the plants and it fed the network of fungus and the fourth butterfly it fluttered around and it flew above the lizard and it flew below the bird and it met another butterfly and it made 10,000 eggs. And then it fell to the ground and it fed the ground and it fed the plants and it fed the network of fungus. 
And the fifth butterfly saw the other four butterflies and it saw the lizard and it saw the bird and it saw the observer and it saw the family butterfly and it made a record of it with the flapping of its wings and sent it out into the world and those flutters became a whirlwind and then it fell to the ground and it fed the ground and it fed the plants and it fed the network of fungus. And that's about all I have to say about that. <laughs> Medicine. Hey. So gentlemen, the only thing I have to add is thank you very much for being here. Thank you too, Chuck, if you revisit this. I really appreciate you taking the time to spend it with me and to share your wisdom and your thoughts with me and with the audience who takes the time to share these podcasts with me and with my guests. Um, I care about you gentlemen and I care about the people who take the time to spend this time with us and I'm confident that they'll take something of value with them from this conversation and I want to just say thank you very much for making it possible. You're very welcome and here's hoping we can the four of us come together again in six or eight months and it'd be an entirely new world where there's no depressing things talked about. We're marveling at, wow, look at this wonderful new thing. Oh, this is cool. And uh, Dennis can show us his uh, newest uh, do hard things gadget that he's cobbled together. <laughs> <laughs> the MacGyver of weight training. Yes. I'm working on it. <laughs> you that's a challenge. On the phone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a good thing. That's kind of kind of the whole thing was you know don't don't get on the porch, old man. Yeah. <laughs> You'll do something hard. Uh, I just want to say, man, it, it's this has really been good. I've enjoyed it. Um, Chance, I appreciate you extending the offer, and uh, it's good to see. Uh, the gray table back together again. Hey. Yeah, I feel uh, it's such a weird thing, uh, but I feel a part of uh, something that I didn't didn't know was going to be there, and it, it was it's it's uh, it's nice. It's nice. Uh, it's nice to be a part of uh, the gray table. Hey. An esteemed uh, member. It's nice to, it's nice to be allowed to sit at the table for a while and <laughs> offer up some hokey, some hokey parables. <laughs> so, so look, uh, you gentlemen are good. I'm good. Hey, I'm good. I am complete. Okay. In that case, Peace. this has been the Logos and Trivical podcast. It's also been the Council of Elders. It's also been the Gray Table, and we've been flooded by the Gray Wave. I've been Chance Lunsford. He's been Billy Redhorse. He's been Dennis Hines. The other guy who left has been Chief Chuck Whitworth. This has all been allegedly, and we are out.